At first I was extremely excited about the escape. I imagined that Labot would organize a covert resistance and we would seize the weapons, take control of the soldiers' quarters, then reverse the standing ceremony and finally leave them tied up in a room. I soon realized that the escape would not be particularly exhilarating. We can't all escape, said Labot simply. Four men have a chance of escaping, forty barely, and it is almost impossible for everyone to escape. If hundreds of us leave, the Mescans will send troops to come us out from the forest, and we have no chance against the army. I nodded with a bitter expression. Geza and Cricket both looked devastated. Labots continued. You know that if we escape, the people left behind will hate me. All my lofty feelings about the escape were gone. This is why I didn't want to be a leader. People will die because of my decisions. Maybe even among the four of us. No, said Geza. Come up with a plan so that everyone comes with us, he told Labort in a rather commanding tone. I was surprised at how bravely he defied Labort, as well as at how zealously he defended the interest of the other prisoners. Labort was not offended by the tone, he replied quietly. I couldn't find a better solution. I have thought about it long enough. Everybody comes with us, Geza insisted. Who's going to feed over a hundred people, said Cricket. Do you have any idea how much food is consumed every day? It was obvious that he had also been thinking about it. What are we going to arm ourselves with when the Mescan army comes? There aren't even fifty rifles in the armory. The four of us have a chance. I didn't really know which side to take. I accepted Laporte's decision, but I was incensed that Cricket would so easily abandon our comrades. Is that so? And how would you feel if we left you here? I asked. I immediately regretted it, but it was too late. Geza joined in. Yes, why should we take you? You're the weakest among us. The three of us will escape, or we'll choose someone else to take your place. Now, as I write this story, physical weakness is far less of a problem than the weakness of will. But back then, in the camp, it did matter how strong we were. No, no, we need Tommy, he is smart. Come on, talk maths like you usually do. I encouraged Tommy, and after a moment's thought, he got on with it. When calculating the limit of a multivariate function, one can try to reduce the parameter space, for example by calculating the derivative along one of the axes. Geza tried to interrupt, but Cricket just kept on talking over him. Or, in the case of an n-dimensional function, by substituting the diagonal of an n-dimensional hypercube. If we get two different values, we can safely say that the function is divergent. We listened to Cricket's mathematical monologue dumbfounded. However, this simple method is usually only useful if, in the numerator, all parts of the function have a degree greater than 2, and the denominator has a positive definite quadratic form. See? Clever. We need him. We weren't going to leave you here anyway. I reassured the boy. Your numbers will do us a lot of good amidst the war. Geza growled. Enough, said Labort quietly. Either the four of us escape, or we stay here and wait for the end. Anyway, Cricket knows a little mess can, and that's useful. I'm in favor of trying to escape now. The attention I'm getting is making some of the Mescan want to get rid of me. The fact that I was interrogated proves it. By interrogation he meant beating and torture. I won't force anyone, and if everyone else is against it, I'll stay. 
decide what you want, but I'm not letting you talk to anyone about it. His face was pale, his eyes blank. He made a difficult decision. He turned away from us, leaving us alone with our thoughts. We didn't have to think for long. We were all trying to save our skins, all fed up with the camp and the slave labor. I used to think of myself as a pious, humane person, but in the heat of the situation, selfishness got the better of me, and I put my own interest before those of my fellow countrymen. I was disappointed in myself. I had to realize that I was only thinking of others as long as I didn't suffer any harm in consequence. The idea may have come to Labord from the fact that Cricket was in the infirmary, as his position was a major factor in the escape plan. Labord had it all figured out, and he told us to up that night by the tent. He must have been secretly planning the escape for a long time. That's why he had been talking to the soldiers so much. He was gathering information and wanted to have a good relationship with them. Nothing came of my dynamite idea. We had to reject all extreme proposals. The risk of being caught was too great. Our plan was to sneak out quietly, have Labots take out the tower guard, climb over the fence, then walk all night to get as far away as possible before they came looking for us. Labot practiced on the pillars in the mine so he could climb up the tower's legs. Rumor had it that there had already been a successful escape, they had erected a tower in the corner and another by the market. The soldiers didn't seem to be looking for the missing people. Of course, there was no way of knowing whether it was because they didn't care about the escape or because there had been no escape and the news were just rumor and the towers were being built because the materials had arrived. We hoped that they would not mobilize large forces, but one could suspect that Labortz's escape would not be completely ignored and that there would be reprisals to dissuade the prisoners from getting up their courage. This was also weighing on our conscience. At the end of the day, staying alive seemed more important than our moral sense. Labort entered the door of the soldiers' quarters, turned to the officer in charge and began to speak. Torben Lauritz sent me to ask for the key to the storeroom. I have to take out the wheelbarrows because the line has gone out. The soldier was reluctant to give him the key. He looked at my friend with narrowed eyes, but Labot didn't get discouraged. He began to explain. We'll collect it in the wheelbarrows. He seemed rather upset. Surely he won't like if he has to walk all the way over here himself. The soldier must have imagined an angry Torben. Probably that scene in his mind made him hand over the key. Labolz did indeed take out the wheelbarrows and then went back to work, handing me the keys as he went. Giza and I sneaked into the workshop and filled the sack we had prepared. We put in as many kinds of food as possible, but only a little of each. It's more noticeable if a lot is missing, and it was better for variety's sake. We hid the bag and returned the key to Labort, who gave it to Torben, so it was eventually put back in its place. Labort said we were leaving soon, so we tried to exchange the leftover insect repellent for potatoes. The camp was rectangular, surrounded by a two-meter-high chain-link fence with barbed wire running all the way around. A tower was built in the northwest corner, from which a sentry with a searchlight watched. As electricity could only be produced by generators, the lamp, known to the prisoners as the Aurora Borealis, was not kept burning continuously. 
If the guard noticed anything suspicious or just felt like it, he would switch it on, look around and then switch it off again. In the western half of the camp were the prisoners' tents. In the center, the soldiers' quarters and the armory. And in the eastern corner, the storerooms and the infirmary. Five guards patrolled the camp all night. The gate was double guarded. We could only attempt to climb by the tower, the closest structure to the fence. We would hide at the foot of the tower and wait for the guard to look the other way before spurring to the fence. The prisoners' tents were guarded. A soldier with a loaded gun marched up and down by the tents all night. The first obstacle to escape was this guard. He had to be taken out at all costs. We could have slipped through the tents unnoticed, but running across the empty space leading up to the fence we would almost certainly have been spotted by the bunk guard, not to mention the one in the tower. In addition, they could easily have seen us as we started to emerge from the tent. But nobody watched the tent in which the sick people were. Only the completely incapacitated patients were housed there. They obviously weren't expected to try to escape. Cricket knew exactly what he had to do. We went over the whole plan many times. Labot talked him through everything. He rolled the bandages off his foot, silently climbed out of the sick bed, crept to the end of the tent and curled up in the corner among the quietly panting wounded. The soldier on patrol along the fence neither noticed the rising tent canvas nor the gap underneath through which Cricket was spying. He waited patiently for the soldier at the fence to move in the other direction and the one patrolling the field to be on the other side of the tents. Cautiously, he crawled under the tarpaulin across to the bunk. He went to the south side of the block of tents, an area that, except for the guard of the field, only the guard on the south side of the fence had a view of. Hiding near a tent, he kicked off his shoes to make less noise and took in his sweaty palms a shovel handle he had prepared earlier. Again, he had to wait a while before the two soldiers were in a favorable position. He tried to breathe calmly and quietly. The clouds were thick in the sky and only a faint glimmer of the moon could be seen behind them, even though it was almost a full disk above the clouds. Cricket could see only a few paces ahead of him, but that meant that the sentinels had about as much idea as him of what lay in the darkness. Their equipment included a flashlight, but it was rarely used. The fieldman had just passed him, the southern fence guard was heading in the opposite direction, and the big light had recently been turned off. Now or never thought Cricket. He sneaked after the bunk guard, trying to step at the same time, so the soldier wouldn't notice the noise made by his bare feet. Cricket's heart was pounding so hard, he feared the soldier might hear his heart beat. His mouth was dry, his hands shaking. He hit the back of the soldier's head with all the force he could get out of his arms, which were about as girthy as a carrot. He tried to catch the unconscious man, but collapsed under the weight. He scrambled to his feet, dragged into the cover of a tent the motionless guard, took his rifle and, pulling on his shoes, went about his business. He only hoped he hadn't made anyone a widow. He did not want to kill anybody, and it was better for the escape if we left the camp without any casualties. The Mescans had less reason to search for us in a serious manner. He never knew if the soldier survived or not. Labort, Giza and I were waiting on standby. Do you think it's past midnight? I asked. Maybe not yet. Geza replied. 
At least we can say we won't go to bed hungry tonight, I joked. The corner of the tent was lifted up, and through the gap, Cricket peeped inside. The light had recently been switched on, so Labot set off immediately. Otherwise he would have had to wait for the tower guard to look around, since our observations showed the light being turned on periodically. Labot took the rifle and crept noiselessly to the west corner of the fence. He began to climb up the pillar closest to the corner, so that he could only be seen from the outside or possibly from the tower above. Neither was likely to happen. Cricket and I waited in the tent, biting our nails, while Geza peered out through the gap at the entrance. About ten or fifteen minutes have passed, but it felt like an eternity. We agreed that if Labot finished quickly, he would come back and we would go to the fence together. If it took longer than expected to take out the tower guard, he would signal with a mirror and a moonlight. The shining mirror was more likely to be spotted than Labot's sneaking, but we wanted to save time so we would have a good head start before they spotted the escape. The overcast night, however, precluded the use of a mirror. The corner of the canvas lifted, a hand reached in, fanning to signal us to come out. We climbed out. Cricket brought a thick blanket, soon together from several canvases, cradled in his hands. Geza and I each carried a bread bag full of the food we had stolen during the day and our few belongings. We hurried to the fence. With practiced movements, Cricket unfolded the blanket, Geza and Labots threw it on top of the fence to protect us from the barbed wire. It was narrow, only one person could climb it at the time. Cricket would go first, then me, then Geza, the two bags and finally Labots. It sounded deafeningly loud as Cricket hooked his fingers into the rhombuses of the fence and the telltale rattle rippled through the metal mesh. I looked around in fright, but saw no enemy. Cricket jumped on the ground. He was already outside the camp. I was just about to climb when we noticed a light coming from one of the buildings. We anxiously eyed it, trying to figure out the cause. Labot jumped up on the fence to see over the tents. Come back, Cricket, he said in a low voice. The boy immediately started to climb up the fence. Someone has set fire to the armory, he informed us as he jumped down. Labot turned Geza and me with our backs against each other and called to us. Watch out for soldiers. Change of plan, he added. The world turned upside down. Suddenly I was thirsty, my heart was still in my throat, every nerve in my body on edge. It was then when I realized we were playing with our lives. Geza kept repeating an obscene word out loud. By the time Cricket had landed on our side, in his haste he let go of the wire net too soon, so he landed on all fours. Not what I would call the majestic landing. Labot was ready with orders. We're going by car. I'm going to get the keys. You too? He was talking to Geza and me. Get the petrol. Cricket, you wait for us at the car, but hide. We signaled that we understood. He put the machine gun in Geza's hand and he himself started running unarmed towards the soldier's barracks. By the time the alarm sounded, Geza and I were already trudging towards the warehouse. The shortest way led between the tents. The prisoners were already coming out, shouting encouragement to each other. Shots were fired. I shrugged instinctively. I was terrified that one of the patrols would see us and take a shot. To my surprise, we found the warehouse open. Entering the door, we looked for the two square petrol cans, but only found one and it felt relatively light. We looked around for a few more seconds to see if we could find the other one, then, grabbing the can and some tools, we headed for the car. On the table, 
Next to some wood shavings was a large knife, probably part of the soldier's equipment but used as a tool, which I picked up and headed north. The car was usually parked next to the ammunition depot, which was against the rules, as it was close to the gate. It was an off-road vehicle unfamiliar to me. It had four seats and the back covered with canvas. At the rear a spare wheel and a metal frame for two petrol cans. Two prisoners were rummaging inside, leaning in through the open doors. It must be in the cabin. Let's go, one of them said, and they started to run towards the building. They must have been looking for the keys. They left, we arrived, so Cricket came out of hiding. Geza stood guard with the machine gun, bobbing his head from side to side. I quickly put the knife away, then helped Tomash. With trembling hands we untied the tarpaulin, threw the tools and the petrol can in the back, we had no time to slide it in the frame. Then waited for Labots, huddled in the cover of the car, nervously watching the events around us. I couldn't fathom what was happening. I had no idea what was I supposed to do, I was confused. There were prisoners running everywhere, climbing over the fence, some attacking soldiers that tried to put out the fire. I saw several dead bodies, including some in Mescan uniforms. Despite the alarm, the soldiers were unable to get weapons as the carefully locked armory stood in flames. We heard voices. Robots was approaching, followed by several soldiers. Geza cursed and raised his rifle to his shoulder, preparing to fight. Labot signaled to him, fanning his hand towards himself, whereupon Geza clicked the safety on the gun and threw it to him. Someone turned on the spotlight and pointed it at us. After the faint glow of the distant flames, we were completely blinded by the floodlight. Keep one eye closed, Labot shouted. He said this so that we could see in the dark when the light went off, but I didn't realize it at the time. Coming up to me, he handed me the key. I heard gunshots and banging noises as I opened the doors of the SUV with shaking hands. I'm driving, said Lobot, his voice breaking into a growl. Cricket jumped in the back. With great difficulty I put the key in the ignition switch that wasn't next to the steering wheel, but in the middle. Then I got out so I could help Lobos with the fight, but he was already in front of me, pushing me backwards. Get in. While I was crawling towards the passenger seat, Geza ripped open the door in front of me, only to rather jump in the back when he saw me. Labot threw himself into the driver's seat. I, frightened, pointed the barrel of the gun at the window. I was afraid it might go off by accident. Labot started the engine, it was as loud as a tractor's. What's this? Labot asked, as he eyed the four sticks between us. I desperately tried to help, but I couldn't understand any of it. It keeps humming, but it's not going anywhere. Geza lurched back and forth restlessly in his seat, spying our surroundings. Labots jerked the gear shift violently towards him and pushed it forward. The engine revved and we shot backwards and I bumped my head on the windscreen. Many people must have noticed the roar of the engine, but no one cared. Reverse is not what I want, Lobots fretted, and after a more cautious movement we started off and ran over something, a dead body I presume, and continued in the direction we wanted to go. I was pleased to find a handhold in front of me, because Lobots floored the accelerator despite the uneven ground. He was gripping the steering wheel with one hand and pulling a vertical lever next to him with the other, which made it rattle rhythmically. Is this the handbrake? 
he asked, but he already released the lever and turned the wheel with both hands to avoid crashing into the burning building. The spotlight was turned off. Of course, I couldn't keep one eye closed, so I just blinked in the dark. I heard terrified cries, and I myself clung to the metal handle in front of me with a similar terror. A flash of net in front of me, followed by a snap and a racket. It was exhilarating to know that we had broken through the fence. Lobots reached his right foot over my side, kicked the slipper off, and I fished the other one out from under his foot to prevent it from getting under the pedal and prevent breaking. He was feeling around the dashboard. I need headlights. He was groping around the steering wheel and in front of him. We drove slowly. It was hard to tell when we would reach the forest. Despite our joint efforts, only a map light came on in front of me, this was for internal lighting. I scanned the interior of the vehicle, horrified. Next to the gearbox, three more levers were sticking out at odd angles, one of which turned out to be the handbrake. On the dashboard were five indicators and further down, around the key dangling in the ignition, two usable and one broken switch, plus a knob and a pull tab. Above those, but not associated with them, were four lights, one of which flashed at a steady rate. The only sign I found read no open flame use and no smoking, in red letters on a metal plate. I tried all the buttons and managed to turn on the headlights with one of them. Laborts headed to the right, wanting to turn onto the road that ran alongside the camp. Very good. No high beams? Lobots asked. I started trying again, even pulling the levers next to the gear shift, but I couldn't get the reflector on. No, it's fine, it's a... Whoa. It doesn't turn so well. Lobots wagged his head as we turned onto the potholed tarmac. Here is the sign we kept trying to guess. To the left, a mellow glimmer of stumps left after a clear cutting dotted the plain, which was rapidly fading to grey in the pale moonlight. While to the right, the trees of the intact pine forest ruled the landscape. The road sign reflected the headlights from a distance. Ole and Art Salon, I read the sign. 